During this time, Malcolm and I mixed with the mods in Aylesbury. We were both 16 years old, and we began to meet with these older boys and were curious to try out pet pills, Purple Hearts, Black Bombers and Dexedrin, and smoke hashish or grass. So we began to make inquiries where to get some. In the meantime, we would experiment smoking crushed coding tablets and dried banana skins. This was purely to satisfy our curiosity and to experience new things. There was a pub in ours we call the Flea Pit, situated in Kingsbury Square, and this was where we understood we could buy hash. However, at 16 years old, I went into this pub and became very embarrassed, as on the walls behind the bar were displayed ladies' knickers in various styles and colours. I felt embarrassed because the sight of these aroused me, as at that time there was very little pornography, and the sight of a woman in a short skirt and legs was very provocative for a 16-year-old. On reflection, I had a high libido, which led to a very promiscuous lifestyle. Shortly after this, I remember my brother coming home about 9.30pm in the evening in a hurry. My parents were out. He had not long been released from detention centre. Our parents were away, and I had a girlfriend there. In came my brother and told me of his narrow escape from the police. About six of his friends had been out in a stolen car when the police had stopped them along the train road and had all jumped out and made a run for it. It was soon after this that my brother got sent to Borsal training for some crime or other. Nevertheless, it all seemed a good lifestyle and I wanted more of it. I had discovered I could buy chloroform from the chemist and this was much better than sniffing carbon tetrachloride or the glue substances that people began to experiment with. Shortly after this, with Malcolm Kirkham, after trying something like this, he took it into his head that he could fly on his scooter. He broke his arm and smashed his scooter in the process, but thankfully not his head, as he was wearing a deerstalker crash helmet that we'd stolen a few days before. The names of some of the lads that we knew that come to mind were Stuart Knight, Keith Guntrip, Ian Wilton, Dil Dowrick, Terry Tatton, he's now dead, Phil Davis, I understand he's now dead, Brian Collier, Mickey Coyle, Roy Mills, John James, Dave King, Jimmy Findlay, Phil Davis and the like, all of which had one thing in common. They wanted to have fun and were the lads of Aylesbury. The time of writing this is about year 2000. At that time, after being sacked from the band, we began to go to a nightclub called the Banbury Gaff. Here, we could stay up all night taking pet pills. We used to say, getting blocked, dancing and talking, and in the morning end up in the caf eating toast before driving back to Aylesbury on our scooters. Soon after this, Malcolm began to mix with the lads in Oxford. He was later sentenced to some time in prison for some crime or other. During this time, my brother was in Borstal, and at the gaff, I met Alan Dodd, He was my brother's partner in crime, and he had escaped from Borstal. He was living on a barge in Oxford. He told me at that time he had a gun, and all this type of living impressed me, as it seemed rather exciting. Later, Michael told me that Alan Dodd had grasped him up, and that was why he had got caught and was sent to Borstal. We would spend time at the gaff, talking with other lads about crimes that we'd done, and planned various schemes, and bragged and boasted about things we had done. From this experience of mine, I can say there is no prevention or cure from this kind of criminal mindset. Once in that routine, you're on the road to serious crime, as all that I knew at that time will confirm. I can also say that a girlfriend could really help someone like this and avoid them getting into too much crime. It wasn't long after the great train robbery that we would find our feet as criminals. In 63, the great train robbery took place on August 8th, 1963, at the Brigado Bridge in Lindlade, just up the road from us in Aylesbury. The thieves laid an ambush for a small mail train running from Glasgow to Euston and stole more than £2 million. For the 125 years, the train had run interrupted until that night, when it was stopped 
by a red light in Buckinghamshire. Bruce Reynolds, who crafted the robbery, was caught in 1969 and sentenced to 10 years in jail. We were very impressed at this crime. In the 60s, in the 60s, Ronnie and Reg Cray were seen as prosperous and charming celebrity nightclub owners and were part of the swinging London scene. A large part of their fame was due to their non-criminal activities as popular figureheads in charitable circuits, being photographed by David Bailey on more than one occasion and socialising with lords, MPs, socialists and show business characters such as actors George Raft, Judy Garland, Diana Dawes, Barbara Windsor and singer Frank Sinatra. They were the best days of our lives, they called them, the swinging 60s. The Beatles and the Rolling Stones were rulers of the pop music. Carnaby Street ruled the fashion world and me and my brother ruled London. We were the untouchables, said Ronnie Cray. In his autobiographical book, My Story... On the 8th of May 1968, the Crays and 15 other members of the firm were arrested. Many witnesses came forward now, now that the reign of intimidation was over, and it was relatively easy to gain a conviction. The Crays and 14 others were convicted, with one member of the firm being acquitted. One of the firm members that provided a lot of the information to the police was arrested, yet only for a short period. Out of the 17 official firm members, 16 were arrested and convicted. The twins' defence, under their counsel John Platts Mills, 